Nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et ora mortis nostre. Amen. Nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Merry Christmas. Merry we Christmas, are, my brother. Yes, indeed. We are here today once again with Luis Medina for Catholic Empire Part 2. After this is actually a, the third total episode we've done on Spanish history. So, Luis, great to have you on the show again. How you doing, brother? I'm doing great. Merry Christmas. Thank you for having me over, Timothy. And uh, thanks to all of y'all who's been uh, very kind in responding to this series. It's a privilege. It's an honor. It's a delight. I can't tell you how happy I am to uh, be part of this project. Yeah, it's it's been excellent. So, so far we've, we've done the, the first episode was the glory of Catholic Spain and the Black Lives Against Her. The uh, then the first part of this more historical track since 1500 we've covered and the last episode we covered the the three great monarchs of the mm -hmm. 1500s Queen Isabella Carlos the first aka Charles the first aka Charles the fifth mm -hmm. and then we have uh, Felipe the second aka Philip the mm second -hmm. the the three great monarchs that we talked about last time we talked a lot about Mexico and Central America. And that that uh, the Spa Spanish vice royalty, mm -hmm. and we talked about the continent. So today we're going to talk about sort of that same period, fifteen hundred to sixteen hundred. But we're going to shift to the uh, southern hemisphere mm -hmm. into two regions, South America and later the Philippines. Yeah. So uh, we all are also going to touch on Pachamama, Incan Empire, fun stuff like that. So, Luis. Uh, here we are in the South American region. Yeah. What is different about this region of Spanish activity? Okay. Well, let's start from the beginning. We usually tend to think that, you know, all Indians, Indians are the same. They don't, uh, you know, they act like the, the same way and they look the same way and all those things. Obviously there are very big, important differences. In this case, we're talking about a, Basically, this is the biggest empire you have in the whole continent because we, we tend to think of the Aztecs as the biggest guys. And that's not necessarily true, at least when it comes to extension, like territory. So the Incan Empire, which extended from modern day Ecuador all the way down to Bolivia and parts of Chile, all the man's regions, that was a pretty extensive chunk of land. The Aztecs, in contrast, was Mesoamerica, uh, which is the central part of Mexico, if you think about it this way almost bordering all the way to the Yucatan Peninsula where the Mayan culture was there. Not the Mayan uh, civilization that was long gone, but the language remained. So, um, you know, size-wise, the Incan Empire was far bigger and, and vast, to put it that way. So also there were, uh, you can see all there in the map, uh, the capital was Cusco, which is, uh, uh, you see it over there in, uh, between Ecuador and Peru. Um, and that was, there was mountains people, whereas the Aztecs were uh, high plains, like a plateau type of people. The Aztecs built an empire in the city of Tenochtitlan, uh, Tenochtitlan in Spanish, which is in the late Texcoco. It basically built a city on a lake, literally. Well, modern day Mexico City is still located. The Incas uh, built Cusco and their capitals, all the cities, in mountain regions. The architecture was a little bit different, while the Aztecs, um, this, in my opinion, this is pretty uh, interesting because the Aztecs used uh, all these buildings and, you know, uh, mortar and whatnot. The Incans did not use mortar. Uh, they actually put stones and arranged them in such an incredible way, uh, even though there was no mortar, 
the that literally you can even put a knife through uh, between rocks you know the same buildings uh, that was kind of a important uh, the Aztecs were well known for being farmers warriors and temple builders uh, and therefore the valley was the perfect place for them to build their civilization the Incans actually built an empire by uh, doing a huge network road of networks uh, through mountains and across rivers um, the, the obviously the stonework being the primarily um, project that they knew the Aztecs religion wise they had um, and the Incans were similar they both had their pantheon of deities the Aztecs the primarily one was Huitzilopochtli which don't worry about pronouncing it uh, was the main deity while the Incan was Inti which is a, a deity of the sun primarily um, the language obviously different Nahuatl for Aztecs Quechua in uh, Incan uh, also, very quickly, Timothy, if I may allow, just gonna we're gonna talk about this later. But the deities were, you know, same thing from the earth, the sun, the moon, the sea, and or all those things. All right, so they they share that similarity, um, and they both obviously had sadly human sacrifices uh, in both regions. That was just common among any uh, pagan cultures. Um, and that was a situation where the Spaniards arrived after getting the permission by the king to conquer South America, we see almost like, if you see the narrative, a mirroring of what happened in Cortes, you know, with uh, the northern part of the empire. So Cortes gets this awesome feat, conquers Mexico. We know the story we covered in last episode. Um, and that was very impressive. Well, Pizarro, which happens to be from the same region, from Extremadura, Spain, as Cortes, uh, now wants to do his own thing. Pizarro, unlike Cortés, Pizarro was more of a quiet man. Cortés was a guy of words. He just was a diplomat. He knew how to work the system. You know, he was charismatic. He was very lucky. I mean, literally, we have a saying, you're, you're as lucky as Cortés, or Cortés is luck, uh, meaning somebody who's extremely lucky. Now, um, question for you, Luis, real yeah. quick. Isn't Extremadura the Our Lady of Guadalupe Extremadura yeah. in Spain? It's the heart of Spain, like anything else. Uh, that's where you find a lot of the, the court of the Castilian you know, heart. It was the province that, for the longest time, fed the rest of the Spanish Empire. That's where a lot of the grains came. Uh, and the wool that literally made it all the way to England. Um, okay. it, it was, it's, uh, but it is the, that is the Guadalupe shrine in yeah. Spain, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay great. Rest, yeah. Um, which... Again, that's a whole different chapter, but it will be super interesting to explore later. Uh, so, yeah, Extremadura happens to be the place. So let's go back to Spain very quickly before we advance with the, with the Spanish uh, in South America. So the navigational you know, culture was dominated by the Portuguese on one side, uh, the Basques, for whatever reason, in the other side of Spain. So a lot of the great commanders came from the Basque country. Um, but a lot of the great conquerors came from Extremadura, that part of Spain, the inland part, you know. Um, so that combination resulted in a very, very efficient way to reach the whole world. So the Basques threw two people to the New World, and then the, the, the Extremeños, what we call it, conquered them. It was really, really interesting. Back to Pizarro. Pizarro is a, a man who Cortes, when Cortes or Cortes arrives to Mexico, modern day Mexico, he was still. He was not old, but he was not necessarily young. He was like in the 30s, you know. He already made a life. Well, Pizarro is in his 50s. You know, he kind of has already settled, has money, but he had a lot of ambition. And he wants to explore what's going on. He tries three times. It's on the third attempt that uh, he starts making inways to uh, Peru, or Peru uh, to the Incan heart. He founds the city of Lima. That's another difference. So Cortes conquers the heart of the Aztec Empire, which is modern day where Mexico City is located. Um, so it doesn't really get destroyed, you know, despite the black legend and all that. And you know, we just got rid of the bad things. But again, with Catholic principles, you get rid of the bad, you keep the good or, you know, what, what is worthy. Lima was not the heart of the Incan Empire. Lima is a city created for travel and commerce purposes. It was kind of like a, uh, almost like a fort for the Spanish. Um, so that's the capital was inland the mountains, Cusco. So they set up sail for the Incan Empire. Just like Cortes, 
he finds dissidents, like he finds rifts between uh, local tribes subjugated, you know, that they want to get rid of the Aztecs. The Incans were more in a civil war. So this turns out to be a perfect opportunity for Pizarro and his associates. And as they go, uh, in 1531, they uh, want to meet with the uh, Incan Empire, uh, which is Atahualpa. Uh, again, don't worry about pronouncing that. And uh, Pizarro says, noticing, okay, we are getting ourselves in something really big and really bad or really good. You know, we don't know how it's going to turn out. Uh, after a long while, they reach the place and they agree to meet at this city or this place, this old small fort called Cajamarca. The Incan um, receives an embassy, emissaries from Pizarro and says, hey, guess what? The governor Pizarro wants to meet with you. Well, the uh, Incan, the em emperor says, no, nah, I'm not interested in it. Well, let, let me tell you what. I'll meet him on a different day. So they agree to meet and that was on November 16, 1532. By this time, the operation of Our Lady of Guadalupe had already happened in 1531, just to keep a little bit context of, of the timeline. And they started meeting and talking and all that. So the day arrives, and this uh, the before the meeting happened with the Incan Emperor, Pizarro, uh, and this is wonderful, honestly. Like, I, I read these chronicles, and it's like, you can't even make this up. So Pizarro sends this embassy, so, but before he, they go, he uh, asked a priest. His name was Fray Vicente Valverde, uh, Brother Vicente, Vincent Valverde. Uh, and he asked, hey, you want to talk to uh, the emperor? And the priest says, yeah, I'll do that. And uh, he goes with the whole party, meets him, and here is the emperor of Incan sitting with his posse and all that in this place, in this fort. And they literally, at this time, they had like thousands of Indians surrounding this whole fort, even though they're meeting here. So they're, they're technically trapped. Uh, but the Incan made up one mistake that I will reveal in a little bit. So as they meet, the priest talks to the emperor and says, and I'm quoting, um, I, am, I am a priest of God, and I teach Christians the things of God. And so I come also to teach you the things of God. What I will show you is God's word. It is in this book. He had a Bible, but this is not a Bible. I'm just using this as a reference. Uh, it's in this book. Therefore, on behalf of God and the Christians, I beg you to accept his friendship, God's friendship, because this is God's will. Please go talk to the governor, meaning Pizarro. He's waiting for you. When he says that, uh, the priest hands the Bible, again, this is just a reference, to the Incan emperor. The Incan emperor is like sitting there with a lot of uh, uh, disdain and uh, pride and all that. Says so like, all right, let me take a look at that. So they hand him over the Bible and he literally just grabs it, doesn't even glance or look at it. And why do I make, that, why do I make this point? Because for the Indians, anytime they saw a book, a Bible, this codex, essentially this concept we have as a book, which is fairly recent, um, they were marveled by it. First of all, because they didn't have written language. The Aztecs had hieroglyphics, meaning pictures, right? They communicate sounds and words. The Incans did not even have that. Do like, you know how they kept record? They literally have uh, uh, had ropes. This is a rose tree. I'm going to with knots. And that's how they kept records of things and they somehow interpreted the length of the ropes and the you know knots and all that that's how they communicated in written form or the closest thing for a written form because it's not even a written form so anytime an indian will look at book they will be marvelous what is this first of all this is paper i mean they will explain it. this is incredible second letters what are this these characters they're letters they you know communicate words oh wow well, the Incan emperor was not even impressed by that. He grabs the Bible and literally tosses it in the utmost sign of disrespect. So the priest goes back to the uh, to Pizarro and to give him the news. And says, hey, guess what? The, the emperor did not want to talk to you. Really? That's a shame. Uh, and then asks, what happened to the Bible? And the priest says, well, he tossed it. Pizarro gets enraged gets up, walks through this whole cohort of bodyguards, Indian bodyguards that the Incan emperor had, 
gets his sword out and strikes the hand where, where he tossed uh, the Bible with uh, to the Incan emperor. But before striking him, he yells or he shouts a war cry that is very popular in the Spanish culture, which is Santiago. I don't know if you remember that episode. We talked about uh, yeah. St. James, the uh, Moore Slayer, uh, King Ramiro and all that. So Santiago, which in Spanish, you know, everybody, know, well, in Spain, they know what it means. And strikes that he was outraged by the fact that this human had such disdain for God's word. This is basically the Spaniard out of coming out of him, you know, all the way through. Forget about he was governor. Forget about diplomacy. You know, if you want to hurt a Spaniard, hurt him what he hurts uh, the most, which is the faith. You know, uh, don't don't dare to insult the Lord or Mother Mary, and you know, because otherwise you you'll see the rage of the Spanish guy. Um, so he strikes it. And uh, everybody's astonished when the the company of Pizarro hears the the, the shout Santiago, Saint James. They understood this a war like call, and they start firing their uh, canyons and uh, 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 rifles, uh, arcabuses. The Indians are shocked, even though they're wondering what is going on with the Spanish crazy guys. You know, we don't get it. And there was another factor. Remember what I told you at the beginning of this story? There was a mistake that the emperor made. Well, the mistake was he was so proud. He was so proud that the day that he went to meet Pizarro, he was so sure that he was going to humiliate all this, you know, little posse of Spaniards who probably smelled really bad. They haven't showered in days. You know, they're in the mountains. Um, and people thought they were like demi-gods almost like... Um, he was so sure that he was going to beat him that he literally ordered his soldiers not to bring weapons. You know, that's how confident he was. Uh, well, when they hear the Santiago call, uh, the Indians were, they had no way to protect themselves. They start running in panic. His highest general runs for cover. He escapes, but now the Incan emperor is uh, now is uh, captive by the Spaniards. And that's how the whole empire fell. Because they had the top guy. And that's the story of the fall of the Incan Empire. Now, after that, literally came decades of civil war. That's one of the contrasts between the North and the South. In the North, Cortes conquers. And really, especially after Our Lady Guadalupe, things settled. I mean, it was like almost paradise. I mean, life was better than even in Spain, to be honest. In the South, it was civil war. And, you know, people bickering and all those things, you know. It was life, the hellish life, for like four decades. Okay, so there's a lot more. Uh, he, Pizarro found a lot of dissidents, like Cortez did, but it sounds like there there was a lot more support for the established empire. Yeah, which then led to that civil war. Yeah, there was a lot more in uh, also the, among the Spaniards. Also, there was quarrelings, there was just power grabs, things like that. It happened. It's almost like a political landscape, honestly, like a modern day political landscape of betrayals and all that. Whereas in Mexico or oh, New Spain, to be more specific, uh, it was more like a smoother transition. And uh, in my opinion, people disagree. Maybe uh, I attribute it to Our Lady of Guadalupe. You know, she mm -hmm. kind of settled the record. Now, did Our Lady of Guadalupe? How much influence did she have in South America? Not very much by the accounts of uh, uh, of the chronicles and you know and the friars and all that. This it got known there, but not as much. It was not such a big deal because we're talking about different civilizations. To the Incans, that I mean, it's like us maybe thinking about like what happens. No disrespect, but like um, somewhere like in Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan or something like that. Nothing against them. It's just. You know, and there's not a whole lot to relate to them in, in, in modern terms. It, the same was for the Incans. Like, well, I guess, cool story. I guess it was for them. But okay, so um, now, when is I was going to ask about the Portuguese mm -hmm. here? I got this the map here. So there's the. Can you tell us about the uh, Tordesillas line? The Tordesillas Treaty was. Let's go back a little bit in time when. In the 15th century, the Portuguese were actually about 50 years ahead of the Spaniards when it comes to navigational techniques. That also makes sense because a Portugal is surrounded. I mean, has the longer at that time the coastline because Spain was also dealing with the Moors, so it was kind of hard to focus dealing with the Moors plus you know being uh, at the top edge of you know uh, maritime technology. 
And I mean, they were the second most powerful, most innovative uh, force, but it was still uh, Portugal, the, the main one. And Portugal was uh, very important because one of the greatest inventions or modifications they did, usually keep in mind that people used to row to get around the sea. But the Portuguese use uh, um, galerones, like, you know, I forgot that term in English, where used like sails and uh, used the wind to their favor, uh, better designed ships, things like that, uh, where they didn't require a lot of uh, rowing from him, human perspective. You kind of work with the elements. That was Portugal's innovation, and that's where they got ahead. So as Spain started growing, the, both of them started having frictions. The Pope settled these frictions because Portugal conquered the Azores and all these islands in the in Atlantic. Um, as the Spanish start getting around to, um, they say, okay, anything from this uh, latitude you see on the map, east of it is going to be Portugal. Anything west of it is Spain. All right, so that was the way to settle. This played a critical role because that force, when Columbus came into the scene, uh, uh, he could not go east. He even had to ask permission to uh, stop by the Azores to, for provisions and all that. Uh, and that forced Spain to keep going west as they keep discovering things because they knew they couldn't go east. Uh, and, and that's the thing. Well, that treaty is called the Tratado de Tordesillas um, or Tordesillas Treaty. And that was the, what separated the boundaries between uh, both countries. So it looks like, from from my knowledge of South America, both the western coast, which is mountainous, and the eastern coast, which is very jungle, are both very different than Central America Aztec. Yeah. Um, and this is actually plays, believe it or not, a key role, a little bit, when it comes to the Philippines as well. Um the the jungle it makes it really really difficult to settle civilization till this day as a matter of fact um, um not to divert but like geopolitical strategies and all that like if you want to build roads in jungles are it's very hard to do that and to maintain on top of that well if that's true now it was even true back then uh and that's one of the key differences also the mountains are very rugged very steep mountains in South America, I um, actually had the privilege a few years back to go to Peru to visit and went to the mountains. Um, and I can tell you, I mean, pretty high, especially if you're not used to it. And I've been to Colorado, I've been in the mountains. I mean, I grew up in Monterey, Mexico, which is a mountain city. Uh, these were real deal mountains. I mean, they got me mountain sick. That how, that's how high they were. So um, just two different scenarios, landscapes, plus the seasons are reversed. You know, once you cross the Ecuador and all this other factors, the Indians had different rights, uh, unlike the Aztecs. The Aztecs had a, a way of commune that kind of resemble, in a weird, twisted way, uh, Catholicism, because the Aztecs had a concept of communion. It was a very gruesome one. Yeah, that skin thing, right? Yeah, they were, but they, that was the way to commune with that person, you know. Okay. Uh, so that was easier to transition in a lot of ways, you know, for them. So tell us about the Portuguese in South America. So the Portuguese started rhyming up South America and they start claiming their land. It keeps advancing. Uh, as you can see, the line is there, but it actually went all the way back to the uh, uh, modern day uh, Brazil and all that. Portugal, once Spain starts growing, um, something interesting happens. They fall into uh, a civil war, not civil war, like, well, it's a um, dynastic problem, right? After King Sebastian. Well, King Philip II, uh, the son of Charles I, marries a uh, Portuguese lady and settles that. And for a while, Portugal was under the crown of Spain, uh, under King Philip. As a matter of fact, he actually had more possessions than his father. And that's when the Dutch, by the way, started attacking Portuguese possessions, you know, after the Thirty Years' War and all that. Like, all these things started convoluting, happening together at the same time. The, just, is, for, just for reference, this is 1580 to yeah. 1640, the Iberian yeah. Union of Portugal and Spain. Portugal and Spain. By that time, you know, we already have both empires, Incan and Aztec, uh, subjugated to the, to the crown of Spain. Philippines was a full colony already or vice royalty. You know, it was just everything was going on. We also had the Protestant rebellion. Uh, we also have piracy now taking place a little stronger in uh, commerce. All these things, uh, missionaries and whatnot. Well, King uh, Philip II 
uh, is the king of Portugal. And right on the time, right at the time where uh, the uh, Dutch started to rebel and they started becoming a naval power, and they started attacking Portuguese possessions. So now Spain has to defend those possessions because obviously uh, Portugal is under their protection. Uh, and then once they separate again in the 1640s from Portugal, taking advantage of the weak situation that Spain is after the Thirty Years' War, um, they go on their own and they start allying with Britain. That takes a different round, you know, go different story. But after that, Portugal starts losing a lot of their possessions as time goes by, um, you know, uh, or most of their African possessions. Uh, Portugal literally goes all the way. If you look at there's a different map and it's beautiful because you see all the islands and places that both Portugal and Spain, whether it was separate together, they lay claim. And it was essentially all Southeast Asia, all the uh, Indian Ocean and, you know, the eastern coast of Africa. I mean, you, know, you see all these places. It's, it's incredible. I mean, it's just they went to so, so many places, both countries. Uh, which is a shame they end up separating. There is a uh, movement, modern day movement. They want, it wants to reunite both provinces because they're honestly more siblings than even cousins. I mean, they're part of the same thing. Uh, very quickly back to Portugal. Portugal was a county in uh, Leon, in Spain. So when the Moors invade the Iberian Peninsula, they uh, little by little you see the Christians start regaining their territory. Well, this Portugal County separates from Leon and eventually becomes its own thing. And just as the Christians started conquering back their homeland, Portugal starts conquering this strip of land in the coastal Atlantic that eventually ends up becoming modern day Portugal. And the rest is history. By the time the Spanish or the Castilians, to be more specific, and the Aragonese kicked the Moors out of the Iberian Peninsula, uh, Portugal is already a, a form functioning kingdom. Okay, so Portugal gets into the Brazilian region. Let me get, I'm going to get back to Span, uh, South America. Mm -hmm. So, where exactly is the cult of Pachamama in all this? Pachamama is really all in South America, but primarily is in the Andean region, Andean region, with the mountains, in other words. So that's why it extends all of that uh, through the Quechua people. Quechua is the language, just like saying Spanish or Nahuatl or English. Um, one of the key differences um, in the Incan pantheon was they had many, obviously many deities, different functions. Uh, Inti, as I said earlier, was the sun um, deity. He was the main guy in the Incan pantheon, even though they have different ones, kind of like Zeus, I guess, in the Greek ones. Um, Ilapa was the god of thunder. Mamakila was the uh, deity, the goddess of the moon. Mama Kuchia was the sea. And then Pachamama was the earth one. Pachamama was the second most important of the deities. This is the earth. And the way they celebrate, they have different rites and all that, but it was on August 1st. Keep in mind the seasons are reversed down there. All right. They believe that the earth will open up, Pachamama will open up from the ground, right? And will populate or bless, to put it that way, the earth with creation and life and, you know, fruits and whatnot. So they will bring offerings to it. Modern day um, reenactments, that's the word I was looking for. Modern day reenactments are not necessarily very accurate because they use elements that are brought by Europeans. You see them use candles, and you see, you see them a cloth. One well, cloth they had, obviously, but like a cloth and fruits and you know all these like food offerings uh, and artifacts and jewelry and whatnot. And they use like uh, wax candles. Well, wax was brought by the Europeans. The Incans did not have wax. Um, New the Aztecs. I mean, the Mayans had some sort of oil lamps things. It was different, but it was not wax. Wax is exclusively European phenomenon, at least here in America. Um, the original concept was to offer them, but here's the twisted spin. Um, Pachamama, when things were bad, think of it like, um, remember in the Bible when we had droughts or famines and the Israelites will commit abominations, uh, adopt Can uh, Canaanite deities and all that? Well, the same thing happened here. Um, in the Bible was Moloch, um, mainly. 
And uh, Quechua was Pachamama, and it was with the child sacrifices. They will sacrifice children in order to please, because they will think, well, Pachamama is mad, Pachamama is mad, let's, you know, sacrifice children and offer them down the earth, throw them in a hole. And um, that's what they did. Um, atrocities just like anywhere else. So the the modern day blanket, the circular blanket with the hole with making offerings into the earth, as well as the the bowl of earth, uh, as well as the idol, all of three of these symbols were present in the Vatican Gardens in the infamous uh, display. Mm -hmm. Are all are all these authentic to this Pachamama Pachamama right? Do you know? Yeah, uh, because Pachamama was represented as a mother sometimes and uh, a life bearer per se. I'm not saying that the Vatican did that on purpose or not. That's not a different topic, a different situation, uh, a different kind of worms to put it that way. What I'm describing is just the Pachamama right in the uh, pre-Columbian civilization. Uh, obviously, in Mexico, for example, let me give you a different example. In Mexico, we have a dish called pozole. I don't know if you had it or any of your viewers. It's very, it's like a stew, very delicious and whatnot. Well, um, originally it's an Aztec dish. Uh, it involved, you know, human meat. Like uh, it was a cannibalistic uh, ritual. Well, obviously now it doesn't have any human meat, um, in, but we still kept the, the, the dish per se. I'm not, not too keen on it, but whatever. Um, I don't know if that was intention with Vatican or not, but my point is the elements with Pachamama, at least with the whole circle and the, uh, effigies and all these things that was part of the deal back then, uh, as it was present. Um, but they involved, especially during the rough years, the, um, uh, child sacrifice or human sacrifices. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, and don't quote me on this, uh, the biggest, um, I forgot the name, uh, uh, graveyard pit of child sacrifices, I think is found in, in near Peru, like somewhere down in South America, uh, which it was originally before it was believed it was in Mexico, but apparently down there they did a lot of that too. Okay. So what was... What was it like Christianizing South America? How was that different than Central America? Um, it was a, a little more of a struggle at the beginning, particularly because there were more frictions both between Indians among themselves and Spanish and Indians. Uh, and then there were uprisings during civil wars. The Incans, for whatever reason, somehow they thought, you know what? You know, think of it like right now in America, the whole like the South shall rise again. People think, OK, we're going to go back. We're going to go back. Well, that same attitude prevailed down there in South America until it was in the mid uh, uh, early. I'm sorry, 1700s. It was finally done with uh, that spirit remain among the Incan people thing, saying it's just a matter of time. We'll be we'll be back to normal. Well, normal never came back, thankfully, if you ask me. And finally, Christianity uh, settled you know, and, and once and for all. And once he was there, obviously, yeah, let's not make the mistake thinking like, oh, there was no real Christians or whatever. May I remind you that St. Rose of Lima, you know, happened during that time in the 1500s, uh, which she was called um, by the Pope patron patroness saint of the whole continent, including the Philippines. So uh, that's not a small deal. <laughs> it's just, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, so there was a lot of great uh, Christian flourishing and, you know, churches, the like Lima Cathedral, among other things. It was just a little harder struggle than uh, in uh, New Spain. And again, thanks, in my opinion, thanks to the Virgin Mary. Excellent. I wanted to find um, Lima Cathedral to show some of that. So can you, yeah. can you mention any more before we get on to the Philippines? Any more in terms of saints? in this period or Saint Martin the porous oh yes yes the uh, uh the the he's uh, a mulatto, mulatto, mulatto. Yeah. yeah i don't know uh, if um was rosa lima was she indian or no, was she, was she... so she her father was a uh, uh, spaniard uh, okay. and her mother was indian she as many of you know this but maybe you maybe don't know it um saint rose 
that was not her original name. Uh, she was nicknamed Rose because she was so beautiful. They they equipped her to the beauty of a rose, and that's how you know everybody called her. Hey, Rose, Rose, Rose. But uh, that was not her name. Uh, she was a very beautiful, beautiful lady. And literally had like often proposals from guys to get married, even after she said, I'm going to be consecrated. I'm going to dedicate myself to the religious life. And still people wanted to. She it was she was so beautiful that she got to the point that she will deface her own uh, body or make mm. herself ugly because she was tired of being asked out. Can you imagine being that beautiful? Um you know, because she will put literally pepper in her face and all that things wow. of that matter. Yeah, that way. Yeah, here's Saint Martin. Yeah, Martin Porres. If I recall, he baptized tens of thousands of Indians and Africans. Mm -hmm. um, well, he was a little bit later, 1639, but Peruvian. Peruvian, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Um, th this is again. Uh, remember last episode we mentioned the difference between uh, thought, like the Catholic thought, is a more harmonious thought than you know the Protestant, which is a more balancing thought. This goes in line with the same thing you see in both all over the Spanish uh, or the Spains, as they like to call it, uh, which means in Spain at that time you will say you're from from uh, New Spain. It will be like you're a Spaniard. There's not such thing as like Mexican or Argentina and whatever it is. Um, they learned how to work harmoniously with the elements they had. And that comes from Catholic thought. That comes from Thomistic philosophy, to be honest, uh, as we explained last episode. And this is one of the prime examples, you know, whereas in Protestant cultures, we see how they had to displace locals and natives. In Catholic cultures, it was more like, okay, we got to work with what we have. We got to, once again, We'll get rid of the human sacrifices and the you know aberrations, but we're gonna bring up the the great things. Um, if you notice in Mexico, modern day Mexico, the Aztecs, um, when you see processions for a later Guadalupe, you see people dancing. Well, why would they dance? Is because I mentioned last time. I think it was like the Aztecs or the Nahuatl people, descendants of the Aztecs, only dance to deities. So that was a way to communicate, okay, we only we don't dance among each other. We dance to deities. So they were dancing, and they realized when you see the image of Our Lady Guadalupe, the knee is bent a little bit. You see on the cloak, it's bent. Mm -hmm. They ask you, she's dancing, so she's not God because she's dancing to God. Who is this God? So obviously, you know, they retain some of those customs. Excellent. Yeah, so here's the Lima Cathedral. Mm -hmm. Another beautiful Baroque yeah architecture that we saw with the mexico city yeah uh i think what one of the things i love about the spanish history is how how the glories of christendom just sort of continue and multiply and they multiply across the earth and it's easy for english speakers to think that the reformation sort of killed things but this cathedral is beautiful. Look, at I mean, that was before electricity and, you know, all these things. Also, may I uh, remind people that even though it was a Baroque period, and this happens, I noticed this uh, by talking to Spaniards till this day, in America, and I mean the whole continent, not just the United States, but even the United States, but in America, Spanish-speaking America, we, culturally speaking, are a little more courteous. Uh, we're gentler to put it that way. Uh, the Spaniards tend to be a little more direct nowadays, modern day Spaniards. They're nice people, obviously, they're awesome. No wonder it was the second most visited country in the world and they love it and all that. But the uh, Iberian Spanish, they, it tends, they tend to be a little more direct, matter of fact. Whereas in Spanish, anybody of y'all who had experience with any Hispanic culture, we use a lot more wording. You know, we go around, we beat around the bush a little bit more. That's not a coincidence because that was brought by the Spaniards, but that's medieval chivalry, to put it that way. So they, you, even though the period was Baroque, the concept, the way of thinking was uh, medieval, which I don't even like to use that expression because it denotes as, you know, something mediocre. It was a medieval age was awesome. But anyway, that's, that's a different topic. But um, when they built these cathedrals, these societies, these courteous ways, the Spain, you know, the, the Spaniards brought that concept. Unfortunately, um, as Europe became very secularized, um, a lot of the language started to change, a lot of the manners, whereas in America, they, they were kept. One of the things I was shocked to learn, 
by Spaniards is some of the bad words we shall shall not say um, have religious connotations. It's kind of like French. You know, they use some sort of religious or sacred objects to denote, to express a bad word. Whereas in for us in Spanish, we wouldn't even think of that way. Uh, that's medieval think, you know, um, and that was brought by Spain. And you see still those gems. You know, I don't know if I told you this or not, Timothy, uh, but the oldest church in Virginia, in America, uh, that survives till this day, you see the architecture, if you want to compare it, I mean, it's, that's not even a contest. You know, one of the earliest churches that the pilgrims built here in the United States. <laughs> yeah. I'm not trying to be... No, I, I totally. Here's here's the Portuguese, what the Portuguese built in Rio de Janeiro. Yeah. Here's the, the cathedral here. Um, we have uh, one uh, Peruvian chatting in. He says, hola, I'm from Peru. Catholic evangelization was very deep and good to the people of Peru. Nowadays, most Peruvians are rooted Catholic Pachamama is not a religion here. It's a superstition. So yeah. shout out to Jose. How you doing, brother? Yeah. Thanks. Excellent. Yeah, I, I love this. I love this Baroque architecture that they're building across the, the, the world. It's amazing. It's beautiful. The Pachamama, before we move on very quickly, if you let me, Timothy, is this is mirroring the same way as like the neo-pagans or the new druids or the Wiccans in England or whatever it is. Like it is reinventing something that wasn't even that way they just wanted they just want to borrow elements from the pagans and it's mainly to spite christianity in particular catholicism you know we're honest that's really the goal uh so they're borrowing the elements from it yeah but they're they're not even they're sorry they're not even doing the whole thing they're not going whole hog uh it's just things that they can borrow to their modern day culture and they use it that way to their convenience Oh, you're muted. Uh, yeah, people don't really want real paganism. Yeah, they, they just want they want Christianized paganism without Christ and human so, rights. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. want human rights. Yeah. Human rights. Yeah. Yeah. with those human rights without without Christianity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyhow, so let's get over to Southeast Asia. Here is a map of the Southeast Asia region with the various. Uh, colonial possessions, and once again, the Spanish vice royalty, yeah. which is different. It's just an extension of the empire. Mm -hmm. So the Spanish have the Philippines. So tell us about the Filipino Spanish experience. 50 years after Columbus arrived into the New World, the Spanish reached the Philippines. After Cortes conquers Mexico, modern-day Mexico, he sends some ships um magallanes is the first one to really make it there in uh lay claim but it was kind of a nominal claim but it was just a matter of fact of time i'm sorry so the spanish conquer philippines again the same way just by mixing with the culture just sending missionaries and all that and the philippines becomes a protectorate of new spain before i continue I want to make an apology to my Filipino brothers because as Hispanics, we often are guilty of forgetting of our Filipino brothers. We see them as, oh, they're distant cousins, but they're not really. They're our brothers, you know, the same. It's just the distance has uh, put a little dent in the whole concept. Filipinos are just as Hispanics as Mexicans or Argentinians or even Texans for that matter or whatever. It's like they have... Equal claim. Um, it's just sad that we don't really uh, remember them. It's not that we don't want them. It's just sometimes they got caught in the blind spot. So the Philippines were uh, the main base that Spain used to actually reach China, which was the dream of the Europeans. The whole point of China, I mean, the new world is just everybody wanted to get to China. Why? Because going through the Mediterranean was dominated by the Ottomans, the Turks, and they were a really mean b they were pirates c they were muslim and d they were if they let you get through which nobody could unless they're you're from genoa uh, they will charge high tariffs and taxes so it was a pretty expensive endeavor literally people wanted rather venture across the world the unknown world than going with the turks that's how bad the turks were um so China was the goal because what do you have from China? Silk, ceramics, species, spices, all these other great things. Well, 
once the Philippines were reached, it became a base in New Spain. Mexico started sending all these friars and Dominicans and priests, and you start seeing the building of cathedrals and all that. And the Spaniards will go to, uh, you see in the map, like Taiwan and, you know, uh, Vietnam and all these other places, Southeast Asia, and trade with the Chinese. And it was trade, um, when we think of trade in, in modern terms, we often, often think of it like um, taking advantage of somebody. That was not necessarily the concept of, of the Catholic, you know, trade, uh, to put it away. It's more subsidiary, to put it away. Like we, we call it distributism now because that's a modern term. But really, it was just the principles were there even back then. Uh, so it was a little smoother transition uh, between trading to the point that uh, Asians, Japanese, went all the way back to Mexico. You know, they just wanted to see what's going on. It was pretty cool. Well, the Philippines became that. It took about three months from uh, Acapulco. They will sell from Acapulco in Mexico and reach all the way to the Philippines. It took about three months. And on the way back, it will take about three to four months, maybe five, depends on the winds, uh, to make the voyage back to Mexico. And this is very interesting because they will carry all these uh, goods and services and the goods, I'm sorry, not services, goods and uh, spices and whatnot. And it was high value. And instead of going all the way to Panama, where modern day the channel is, you know, the canal, um, it's a lot shorter to cross and all that. They went to Mexico or Monterey, California, modern day uh, United States. Why? Because the jungles in Central America were so lush, so harsh, and malaria. Uh, so they, they, they could not get through. It was a very expensive, very labor-intensive uh, to get through those jungles. So they decided to go through uh, Tehuantepec, which is in southern Mexico. Any of y'all who have been to Oaxaca in the southern part, do you see this plain between uh, Mexico and the Gulf that they can cross? And that, that's the way they cross among the amongst the country and then they went to the gulf of mexico back to cuba cuba will be like your super gas station in texas will be bucky's i don't know and in, in, in the midwest like uh what's the name anyway Meyer. my yeah something yeah. like that you know <laughs> quick trip i don't know um it will be like your mega gas station and then from there all the way to the motherland you know with all this and from the motherland all the way to the lower countries and all that well um, with the Philippines, it was such they lasted for the quite a bit of time under the Spanish rule. As a matter of fact, we'll talk later about how the independence happened and affected and all that. But uh, the Philippines remained very, very faithful and loyal to to the Spanish crown for a long time, and they were crucial uh, to uh, to the Spanish Empire. That's actually when Spain became the first global empire ever. Let me add a little footnote here. So Spain is encountering this, all these indigenous tribes, whether it's the Aztecs, the Incans, um, crazy tribes that were not civilized. And by civilized, I mean like the Aztecs had streets and some sort of law. And I mean, they had a system going on, a, a, a hierarchy and all that. So it was, so did the Incans. A lot of the other tribes were just like hunter-gatherers. And hunter-gatherers are awesome. The problem is that hunter-gatherers do not build civilizations in, in art and architecture. They don't leave a legacy, you know. Um, so the Spanish had to do with all these different tracks, uh, whether civilized or uncivilized, and they keep conquering. One of the things that any none of these tribes had was Roman concept of law. W what do I mean by that? In the uh, indigenous tribes, whether it was in the Philippines or whatever, the law was made by whoever had basically, you know, he was whoever was the warlord, the biggest stick one, in other words. It is Spain in Europe, obviously, but Spain, so they were the first ones to get here, that brought this concept of law protecting you against the state or even the church. I mean, we have canon lawyers, right? Uh, that comes from the Roman law. You know, we appeal to Caesar, well, we appeal to, to, uh, uh, the magisterium or whatever it is, the Indians have no concept of it, of law. So now that they're part of Spain, they have not just like, they're not only allowed to exist, they have rights and they can appeal to those things. They can literally sue the crown, uh, as Christopher Columbus did, by the way, um, and even win. That was unheard of. 
that that's for the Indians were like, this is awesome. And they have also protections and you can actually excommunicate an emperor. That was crazy. I mean, religious aspects like Incan uh, or, you know, the, the emperor was also the highest priest and all these things. What do you mean you can? So the Incans were learning all these concepts. Plus they were preserving their language and all these things. All that was brought by Spain. And the only reason why they were able to sustain that, a global empire uh, before electricity, it was because of, you know, Roman thought, Christianized Roman thought, obviously. That's excellent. I wanted to show a few things. Um, there is one of our, ch um, somebody who's chatting in is Filipina who recommended this. If I can do this, let's see if it comes through properly. Um, okay, so this is the uh, Magellan's Cross, which is planted by the Spanish and the Portuguese in 1521 mm -hmm. in, in uh, Philippines. Yeah. And I found the uh, the e different ethnic groups I found very interesting that uh, are in, uh, if I can do this correctly again. Oh, so, he okay, so here's the the expansion here of, of Spain mm -hmm. in the Philippines, Manila, they mm -hmm. go to Manila and they're uh, going down. But then we have the different ethnic groups. It, it, it It's, it's very varied. It's got a lot of, a lots of different um, groups here yeah. in uh, the Philippines. Let's see. In Castilian, by the way, you saw that on the map. Uh, the Philippines just spoke uh, spelled it with K, because they they don't have they didn't have the C sound. Or... Oh, okay, yeah. But yeah, you get the point, Ryan. Like it's okay. This is what I was looking for. Okay, so here's all the different language mm -hmm. and ethnic groups in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So there's so many different already. So many different islands. So. What's it like Christianizing? I thought that was a very great point you were making about the concept of law, which is really just bringing a logos, mm -hmm. a logos understanding versus a voluntarist, which is just the, the will of the strong is, yeah. is the rule of, of the land. Whereas yeah. logos is an independent law, which the ruler himself must also be subject to. I think that's a yeah. great concept, which is really freeing from tyranny. Yeah. Like you said, that's something that frees the individual from tyrants and warlords who are just seeking to impose their will on people. It's, yeah, king of the hill. Yeah. So tell us about the Christianization of the Philippines. I imagine it's, it may be even harder than even South America with, with the islands. Uh, not so much, as a matter of fact. And you know why? Because Mexico or New Spain provided a great lab for the Dominicans and Franciscans and Jesuits eventually to, uh, for the Philippines. So basically they were battle hardened, um, by, by that time. And, uh, so by the time they reached the Philippines, they already kind of knew how to deal with native cultures, what kind of concept they had, um, especially the Aztecs, to be honest, were like really, really tough tests because unlike the Incans, they both were warriors, but the Aztecs were particularly, think of it like the Spartans of the New World. They were particularly warrior-minded, you know, geared to that way. They were fighters, native fighters. That's the whole purpose. And they were fighters because they were trying to collect slaves for sacrifices, particularly. So dealing with that, understanding that culture really toughened you up, just like the Spaniards. Were toughened by 700 years of struggle against the Moors, which that's quite a bit of struggle, to be honest. They will change the way you see things that will make you uh, very deliberate on your Catholic faith. Well, the same friars uh, in New Spain were pretty tested, and by the time they reached the Philippines, they kind of had an idea, you know, how to deal with that and what worked and what didn't work. Okay, so there's is there not as much of an empire? Is there any empire really in? No, 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 no. There were tribes. Uh, the problem is with the uh, Philippines. They were heavily, just like any civilization in Asia, highly regulated by China or Japan at times. That the, the kind of set the tone. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Here's a question from um, I believe 
if I'm, I think uh, Michael V, I think this is actually a Filipino, if I'm not mistaken. So Michael V says, uh, can Luis talk about how the friars priests treated the Filipinos? Because some Filipinos believe the Spaniards just abused them. This is really the black legend. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can touch on this same question for South America. Mm -hmm. Weren't all these bad Spanish people just coming and killing and pillaging? Um, a lot of it obviously is black legend. Um, a lot of it has to do, as you mentioned, with that. And, and a lot of people forget this. That's what I'm trying to say. There is a strong bond and connection between the Philippines and Mexico or New Spain. They share a lot, actually, culturally even. So a lot of what you see in the Philippines is actually a lot of New Spain because that's where the you know, testing grounds were happening. Um, and when this black legend arose in the Philippines was a little later down the road when the Americans essentially intervened in the Spanish-American War and, and they took the Philippines away and they start forbidding um, the Spanish language and also imposing uh, Protestantism. All this, there's a, bond of, a ton of abuses, sadly, that, that happened. And one of those abuses, I mean, there were actually literal abuses, but one of those was um, subverting the culture. Uh, and one of those, how, how do you confuse a culture? I'll tell this, especially now to Americans, is when your enemy knows his or her identity, your enemy is dangerous. And fighting your enemy when he or she's dangerous doesn't really make a lot of sense. You have a lot more to lose. But when your enemy's confused, it's easy. I mean, because they don't know what's going on. So you need to confuse them. That's where the Soviets did, or they're doing to America, honestly. Like what former Soviet teaching with propaganda and all those things. They're all the same old tricks. You use propaganda to uh, confuse people. Well, the Filipinos had a very strong Catholic Hispanic identity. And that had to be broken down, and it was broken down through propaganda. Yeah, we'll talk all about the the role of the United States, which is a very, very large role in attacking New Spain and all that our fathers built here of a Catholic civilization. I wanted to also, since we've been just touching on all these great cathedrals, here's the Manila Cathedral, Um 1571 originally as parish church, but this is the final construction of the original cathedral. Uh, again, just the beauty of the the Baroque, the logos yeah. of this beautiful architecture being the, really the gospel being constructed out of stone in all these places. Yeah. Beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Uh, here's a, a very important question that we, we should really just mention this every show. Are there any books that refute the black legend? The most popular in English I'll recommend is Tree of Hate. Um, and there are more. I have a list that I've actually linked on uh, one of their videos, if I'm not mistaken, Timothy. And I'll, I'll bring it again. Uh, books in English. There are not as many as in Spanish. But uh, I have a list that I can link again. It's not a problem in, uh, at the end of the show. And also in Spanish uh any author i would recommend start with uh professor barsena uh dr ayuso uh maybe even novel historical novels like uh jose javier esparza or the master the uh, one of my one of the greatest minds that in spanish uh is patricio lons the argentinian historian a living legend excellent i was just trying to find I'll get this in a second. You because you originally in our first video, you you gave a long list. Yeah. And I'll get that list. Anyways, I'll, I'll get that list for anyone who's watching. I'll get the list. I'll put it on the the uh, notes as well. Uh, so any other questions or comments from any anybody, especially shout out to all our brethren in South America and the Philippines yeah. watching this. Absolutely. And Spain, man. I, honestly, before we, we run out of time, I want to dedicate this show to Spain, uh, we, which we're forever grateful for, and Argentina, which today they're dealing with abortion. Uh, so we need your prayers. And um, obviously our country, America. And if you can spare a prayer for my uncle that passed uh, yesterday, I'll appreciate it. His name was Javier Berain. Yes, we'll offer up an Our Father at the end of this show. Uh, Luis, tell us about what are you working on right now? What's your, what's your, uh, what are your projects with your own podcast? Tell us about what you, what's going on with you. Well, starting next year, we're going to do a little series in English, um, on the Spanish history with a little more details. Cause apparently a lot of people want to know more about the details and things like, you know, the dexterity school, things like that. So I'll do that, uh, short video clips, obviously collaborating with you anytime you have me over. 
And in Spanish, we're going to, in Reconquista Network, which is my channel in, in Spanish. And I have some English content too as well. Uh, but uh, English content, I'm sorry. Not, not as much as in Spanish. We're starting uh, new videos again, uh, podcast, and soon a uh, quick online store for people who want to just support us, our channel, um, you know, through uh, our store. Actually, yeah, I think we have a lot of Spanish speakers who watched this show just now. So definitely check out Luis's channel, which is linked below. He's on Twitter, Facebook, and his YouTube channel. So please check it out. Definitely. So um, Luis, thanks so much for coming on once again. Um, so part three will be what 1600s to 1700s yeah is that the next period we, we need to cover period. yeah probably yeah excellent the all Frank, right the bourbons oh yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah we've had the good habsburg rulers and that's that's been very much the cause of a great deal of this good civilization it's been advancing yeah but once again uh we need to thank god for spain that this is the reason that there are millions of Catholics today in this world is because of Spain. And so we need to thank Spain, uh, thank God for Spain and honor Spain. Yeah. And uh, let's offer up our father here for the intentions Luis just uh, mentioned, uh, and especially for our Spanish brethren dealing right now with the situation that they're dealing with in their country. Yeah. In nomine Padres, Fidi, Spiritu Sancti, Amen. Pater nostra, et qui es in jadis, sancti vegeto nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat valentas tua, sicut in cedo et in terra. Pane nostrum quotidianum, da nobis odie, et dimiti nobis de vita nostra, sicut de nos dimitibus de vitoribus nostris, et et nos inducas in tentationem, se libera nos amal. Amen. In nomine Patris et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. <laughs>